Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles this morning, open them to Psalms chapter 118. Psalms chapter 118. This is the time of year that shiny little presents start showing up underneath the tree. And they get those little tags on them and they, they usually say to somebody, from somebody. And uh, I remember a few years ago, I started seeing those change from saying two, they started saying four on there. Has anybody else seen those tags? It says four. Uh, and so you know, I, I threw together a little graphic today because that's what I want to talk about today is something that's for you. Um, I remember when I was really starting to figure out how Christmas worked and um, I... I uh, went and looked under the tree, and I would find, and, and if any, nobody else is guilty about this, then you can just come on down to the altar and, and repent for lying. Um, but I remember going and, and looking under the tree and seeing a bunch of, bunch of packages on there, and I know that the, the little kid in me always thought every one of them was for me. But then I started to kind of figure it out, and I realized that not everything under that tree was for me. Um, but I, I could tell which ones were for me because they had that little tag on there. And I would uh, start finding the the tags that said Brent on it. And I remember one year, and I was actually pretty good about it, but uh, one year I decided I'm going to try to sneak some of these open and see what's in there. And um, never did that, huh? Okay, well, praise God. Praise God for you. Um, some of you that are saying that are probably like, no, I always knew where my parents hid them, and I just went and found them while they were not opened. Um, but I remember one year I, I did, I did, and uh, one year my, my mom and dad, which they're here this morning, my mom can testify to it, they got, they got this little Harley Davidson motorcycle phone, and I had opened it and looked at it, and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And uh, my mom figured it out, and she took it back. <laughs> and uh, she's like, I'll teach you, son. <laughs> and um, so, you know, when you, when you know something is for you, it's something that you want to get into, it's something that you want to experience. Um, you know, we bought, we bought a couple little stocking stuffers for Preston and Peyton the other day, and uh, that lasted all of about two hours. They knew that, that we had them, and of course, they were beside themselves. And, you know, uh, they wanted them now. And they just kept begging and begging and begging. Please, 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 please. I'm like, son, it's a cup. It's all it is. It's just a cup. You know, you know it's not like it's going to change your life. Uh, it's not like something you've been really wanting for a long time. Uh, it's just a cup. And it's like, yeah, but I want it so bad right now. And um, I have found that when people start discovering things that are for them, they want to enjoy the benefit of it right now. Come on, somebody. You know somebody's bought you something. You don't want to wait for it. You know somebody's given you something or designated something for you. You don't want to wait for that. You, you know, if somebody said, I've got a million dollars laying around here for you, but, you know, uh, and it's yours, you'd be wanting to go and get that, your hands on that money right now. And that's what we're going to talk about today is that God is for you. Come on, somebody. Amen. And it, it, there's a lot of about God that is for us now. Yeah. One person, my wife, amen to that. Come on, there's a lot about God that is for us now. Not just in the sweet by and by when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. No, it's for us right now. Um, th th this is greatest gift that's been given to the human race. It's the gift of redemption. It's the gift of right standing. But come on, it's also the gift of blessing for our lives right now. And that blessing is for you now. I don't know if everybody decided to sleep in today or they're still asleep while they're sitting here. But you, you can Amen. And you can get excited about it, even if it's by faith. Psalm 118, 
Verse number one says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercy endures forever forever come on let direction church say his mercy endures forever look in verse 5 I called on the Lord in distress the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place another translation there says large place come on somebody the will of God is a roomy place to be (laughs) then in verse 6 he says this the Lord is on my side I will not fear what can man do to me the Lord is is the three words right here are huge is for me among those who help me therefore I shall see my desires on those who hate me Turn over a couple of chapters, well, three or four actually, to verse, or chapter 124, verse number one. Same guy writing this, 124, verse eight, he says, What if the Lord had not been on our side? Let all of Israel repeat, What if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us? And then he tells you what would have happened. They would have swallowed us alive in their burning anger. The waters would have engulfed us. A torrent would have overwhelmed us. Yes, the raging waters of their fury would have overwhelmed our very lives. Praise the Lord who did not let their teeth tear us apart. We escaped like a bird from a hunter's trap the trap is broken come on somebody and we are free you know this is talking about you right (laughs) he's talking about you here Uh, what do you mean come on you're supposed to be a greasy spot in the universe right now and in hell I'm telling you, I, I, I'm serious, I'm about ready to wheel that coffee cart in here and hook an IV up to you. <laughs> you're supposed to be in hell right now. Come on, you ain't even supposed to be here. You, you should be dead and in hell right now. You don't know me. I, I know all of us are supposed to be dead and in hell right now. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm supposed to be dead and in hell right now. But see, why aren't we? Well, because God is for me. He's for me. And he broke, he helped me escape like a bird from a trap and then destroyed the trap. Come on now. Now, I'm not going to go any further until you get yourselves wrapped around this this morning. You're supposed to be somewhere else, but God made sure you're not. You're supposed to be in trouble, and God made sure you're not. You're supposed to be broke, and God made sure you're not. Come on. You're supposed to be sick, and God made sure you're not. You're supposed to be dead, and God made sure you're not. You're supposed to be depressed. Come on, and God made sure you're not. (laughs) And then he tore it all up so we can't go back there. (laughs) why did he do that verse 8 our help is from the Lord who made heaven and earth listen y'all God is for you (laughs) he's for you that word for means the positive or supportive side God is positive and is on the supporting side of you. 
It also means this, the one who's holding the positive or supportive side. That's what for means. God is positive towards you. He is supportive towards you. People are having a hard time with this this morning, and it's no wonder. Some people think or want to talk about everything God is against. The emphasis in the church has always been that. God is against sin. Come on, somebody. We've heard it all. We've all been in any kind of church service for any length of time at all. God is against sin. God is against flashiness. God is against you being foolish. Come on. God is against this. And God is, I mean, I grew up in the Pentecostal church. God is against long hair. Come on now. God is against. The pastor wearing jeans. I mean, I, my pastor never wore anything but a suit and tie. Come on, anybody else? God is against smoke and lights flashing in the church. I've heard that one a lot in the last five years. Because <laughs> the emphasis is on what God is against. <laughs> Come on, it's so dark in there. God's against darkness. God's against this, and God's against that. Some people want to talk about it. Many people have been raised to believe that God is pretty unpleased with everything going on here in the earth. <laughs> and it's no wonder why the world thinks we're all crazy. Why would you want to go serve somebody who's against everything you're doing? Why would you want to have a relationship and talk about how good somebody is if he's just against everything you are? Many people have been raised to believe that God is holding back something from them. Because, well, you ain't, you ain't worthy to, 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 to receive it anyway. Many people have been raised to believe that God's going to do his best to keep you humble. He's not going to bless you because you'll just get arrogant and you'll just think it's all about you. And so he ain't going to bless you. He's against that. He's against them so much that they, so much that they've got going on in their life that they, they just think I, I'm, I'm so shortchanged and I'm, I'm so not perfect, and I've so got so many shortcomings in my life, God would never bless me. <laughs> Am I talking to anybody this morning? Or just myself? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, 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 I want so badly to, to think God would bless it, but man, I am such a... Uh, a loser. I'm, I'm, I'm so, I mean, I, I've got this issue I've been dealing with for a long time, and I've got this going on in my life, and I've got that going on in my life, and I'm, I'm just not worthy. Can I just tell you something? This is a trick from the enemy. Listen, he is the one who's against you. And his greatest trick is to get you to believe God's against you. Had many conversations with people like this. God cannot do something for me because of what I've done in my life. That's you listening to the wrong person. <laughs> He's against me. He's trying to get trying to get, you know, get my attention and make my life hard so I'll stay humble and seek him. No, that's not him. <laughs> He's not against you. Well, but but pastor, God is against sin. Aren't you going to sit there and you going to tell me God's okay with sin? Well, what happens if you sin? Does that mean God's against you? <laughs> Are you so sure? Because the way some people act, you'd think that's the case. You're going to tell me that, Pastor, 
God's okay with sin? That's not what I said. But if you sin, does that mean God's against you? We put so much emphasis on what God is against that we've almost gotten to the point where we have started to believe that in order to be a quick Christian, we have to take a stand and be against things. Hello, 2017. If I'm going to be a Christian, I got to be against this, and I got to be against that, and I got to be against this, and I got to be against that, and, and I can't. Go. Listen to me. God is not against, God is for. Pastor, are you tell me God's for sin? That's not what I said. But God is not against you. God is not against sinners. God is for them. Well, that doesn't sound right. If God wanted to demonstrate that he was against us, all he would have had to do was nothing. Come on, somebody. If he was against you, all he had to do was nothing. It was all already stacked up against you and coming against you and it was already unleashed on you. And he could have left you with no hope. I need you to catch it. I need you to catch this. If God was against you, he could have left you in the situation that we were all in. God could have, uh, w wouldn't have to try real hard to find something against you either. I mean, if, if, it's, I mean if, if he really wanted to demonstrate that he was against you, it'd be real easy <laughs> to find something to show you why he's against you. Wouldn't it? And don't give me any of this faith talk. Oh, no, brother, it's all under the blood. Yeah, well, what about the seven things you did this morning while you was getting dressed? How'd you know about that? <laughs> We've all been there, all done that. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Go to grip, grab that outfit that you wanted to wear and you find a stain on it and you get mad. Come on, you say things you didn't want to say. <sighs> I can't believe it. <laughs> it wouldn't be hard for God to find something against you. I mean, that, that would really look like you'd be saying, to walk outside and say, I'd really like to see a blue sky. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Well, it's just there. <laughs> and in spite of something that's that easily found that he could be against you about, come on now, he is still for you. He's still for you. Don't ever go and tell yourself or allow yourself to believe that, that, that nobody believes in you. Don't go tell, tell yourself that nobody cares about you. Don't go and tell yourself nobody has my back. Come on, don't ever let yourself believe that because the most important person in your life totally believes in you and always believes in you and he's for you. God was for you even when you were against him. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5, verse number 6. I'm going to show this to you. Verse number 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for, you should circle that, and then his next, these next, the ungodly. Well, who's that? Come on, that's us. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous ma man uh, will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. Come on now. Christ died 
for us. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Now listen, if he was for you when you were against him and you didn't care about him and you didn't have a relationship with him and he wasn't, you know, somebody that you even thought about and, and when you did think about it, you were like, oh God, I got to go to church and oh God, oh I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to have to do that. But listen, if he was for you when you was like that, come on, how much more is he for you now that you do belong to him? Come on, how much more is he for you now that his blood's running through your veins? Come on, how much more is he for you that you're one of his kids? Come on, and that you're an heir to everything he has. How much more is he for you? God's not against you. He's for you. He has positive thoughts. He has great and mighty actions towards you. He's done things to support you that you didn't earn. Come on, and you don't deserve. <laughs> How can he be for you? Well, it's because of Jesus. And Jesus didn't die and ride, come in the manger, die on the cross, and raise from the grave just so you could have eternal salvation. That's part of it. That's the big part of it. Because this is the, this is the briefest thing we will ever do. What's that? Live on this earth. This will be the briefest you go, man, I don't know. I feel like I've been here a long time. I mean, this is a long time ago. I was born. And this is a mere, not even drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Come on, this is the briefest thing we will ever do in our existence. And so the majority of our existence is the eternal security Jesus got for us but listen he didn't just get us that jesus secured every need we would ever have including come on eternal security Amen. jesus came to die for your sins but he also came to ensure that god wouldn't hold anything back from you while you're here on the earth Come on now, don't get quiet on me. He wants to make sure that if you need something here, come on, he's for you. Yes. And you'll get it. Yes. <laughs> Some people, when they talk about blessings, they think eternal salvation is all there is. That's for sure. And you know what? Most Christians, you can talk to most Christians, and they will, they will talk about their eternal salvation the way Pentecostals talk about healing and and, and faith people talk about healing. They'll talk about it the same way. You get a Baptist person talking about being saved, and they sound like a word of faith preacher. Seriously. No, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, and there's nothing you can say that would talk me out of that. You get a charismatic talking about healing like that. Oh, no, by stripes I'm healed, and there's nothing you can say, come on, to talk me out of it. They sound the same. Why? Because it's the same. It's received the same. But there are some people that believe that that's where it ends. That your eternal salvation is, you, you can be as rock solid sure about that. And then anything else that happens, well, at least you have a shot at something good happening now. Just, but it's almost like winning the lottery. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to ask God to, to, to heal my dog. But if he doesn't, then I guess it wasn't his will. And the uh, poor old dog's now in heaven waiting on me on the couch, just sitting in the couch in my mansion waiting for me. Come on now. And that's the way a lot of people approach anything else from God. It's like, well, I have a shot because I'm his child, but, man, it, it just depends on if he pulls my number out today and I win. I mean, there's, there's a possibility, but... Uh, 
they, they have their hope in those numbers. They're going to, come on, healing Powerball. I mean, <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse number 31 tells us about these things. He said, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? Now, this is great right here. If God is for us, can we change that background so they can read it? If God is for us, now we all know this part. Well, who can be against us? All right, we love that one. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us, won't he also give us everything else? That went back there and hit that back wall. <laughs> if he didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for, come on, for us, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom, uh, whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. Now here we go right back to it again. For Christ died for us. You're going to catch this by the time this is, we get to the end. And was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hands pleading for us. Now, who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about all of creation, but he's also talking about the church here. Come on, he's for you. Would there be anything else more valuable to the father than the life of his son? I, I, I don't know of anything. There's nothing else more valuable to the father God than the life of his son. The life of Jesus was the most precious and valuable thing to the Father. Now catch this. And he still gave that. Now the most valuable thing he had, he gave it. <laughs> Has anybody ever had to do that? You know, the most valuable thing you have, you know, it's like the, 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 the you know, that one thing that just... You've had it for a long time, and God starts dealing with you to give it away. And you go, Whoa, what? I mean, what? You know? How about you save money? And you got a little stash over to the side, a little emergency fund. And God says, I'm going to need you to give that away. And you go, hold on just a minute. I've been tithing, I've been giving offerings, and I've been saving. And now you're going to ask me to, get, come on now, give what I saved? What? The life of Jesus was the most precious and valuable thing to the Father. And he still gave that. If God was willing to give the most valuable thing that he had. And then you go take it a step further. And Jesus was willing to go ahead and give himself up. Why is it so hard to believe that anything else would be hard for him to give us. Come on. Yep. Yep. I mean, if, I, if I've already given up the most valuable thing I have, you know, come on, nothing else really means that much. Right. 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 And the Bible says, well, he didn't spare the most valuable thing he had, so now anything else is easy. It's, there's nothing really, it's just easy. Whatever else you need, Jesus' Jesus's value secured that. 
I, I got to say it again. I got to say it again. Whatever else you need, whatever else you need, the value of Jesus, come on, secured that. Yeah. Now, see, we're okay with, yes, he, he, he secured my salvation, and I'm going to heaven when I die. But we're all not quite so sure that it secured our healing, come on, and our prosperity, come on, and our blessing, and our happiness, and our joy. But why is that more expensive, come on, than your eternal salvation? It's not. Jesus' value secured all of it. My uncle, who I talked about last week, that owns the Mount Air Estate just outside of Washington, D.C., he owns the company that rebuilt the Pentagon after 9-11. <clears throat> Translation, he's a multi, multi-millionaire. Multi, multi. Stupid rich, that's the right word, yeah. <laughs> Stupid rich, yeah. And I told you that story about how he went and, 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 and had to go to Switzerland to buy the, the holding company that, that owned the house and the farm that he wanted to buy because they weren't giving up any of their assets. They were just going to sell the whole company. He just said, okay, well, I'll just buy the whole company. Now, some of us go, well, that's obscene. <laughs> I mean, you could just do that. I want you to catch the illustration here. Everything that he wanted was inside that holding company. But there was a whole bunch of other things on top of that. Now, ultimately, come on, the Lord wants to have a relationship with you that will last forever. That's ultimate. But see, this wasn't just, come on, just a one thing. He realized that those people are going to be there on earth until they can get to me. So I got to take care of them to make sure that when they get here, they have something here. So they don't just show up and have nothing. They're going to they're they're have to live their life there in order to have, come on, a reward here. All right? So I'm going to have to take care of them there. And I don't want the people that belong to me representing me come on the wrong way with just come on scarcity and sad and hurting and broke <laughs> so i'm gonna go ahead and secure it all for him now listen paul said that inside that holding company was the 600 acres and the the old civil war mansion and you know, right waterfront on the Potomac River, and it was everything that they wanted. And I mean, I mean, seriously, <laughs> and my mom can tell you she's been there, Jody's been there. It is something. When you step out on their front porch and you look down, and it's a quarter of a mile down to the river, and it's just all grass, and it looks like something out of a movie. And then you can see there's a little boat dock down there, and it looks real teeny until you get up there, and then you realize this boat is massive. And then you, and, and you start seeing all the things that he wanted. And so then I said, well, what else was in my, oh, you know, there was property here, and there was property there, and there was pieces of, you know, com this company, and there, was, and there was all kinds of other things that he ended up purchasing with that. That was extra. Okay? Jesus did the same thing when he died and rose again, he purchased a relationship with you, but then he also purchased everything you'd ever need while you're here on the earth that you could have. He is for us so much that he gave all of his value, come on now, not just to secure eternity, but to secure a life here on the earth that the Bible says, come on, a life more abundantly. Why is my material need more valuable than what Jesus died for? Come on, why is my physical need more valuable than what Jesus died for? Come on, it's not. Why should it cost more to be blessed here? It doesn't. Look, at, let's read on here in Romans. Skip down to verse number 35. Could anything ever separate us from Christ's love? 
Does it mean he no longer loves up loves up if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we're killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. And people read that and go, see, Pastor? <laughs> it, it didn't. He didn't secure that for us. He's telling us that we have to love him in spite of all those things. True. He is saying that. But he doesn't leave us there. The very next verse explains it all. He says, no, despite all these things, we can have eternity in heaven. No, that's not what it says. Well, in spite of all these things, we'll stay humble. Come on. And just you know, barely get by because we're going to spend eternity in heaven. That's not what this says. No, despite all of these things, my heart will be kept in the right place because I'm broke and depressed and, and, and upset all the time and, and, you know, and have really bad my, things never work out in my favor. And, you know, but, you know, I, I've got God. That's not what that says. It says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory. Come on, somebody, please grab this. Overwhelming victory. Not is, listen to me, it doesn't say will be ours when we walk into our mansion on the streets of gold. No, it doesn't say despite all these things, overwhelming victory will be yours one day. It says, come on, somebody get happy with me. Overwhelming victory is, that's present tense, that's right now, and that's not tomorrow, that's today. That's this minute, that's this very second, is ours. How? Through Christ Jesus who loved us. Come on, he's for you. He is for you. Because Jesus came for you, you can have everything you need right now. It's like that nervous by faith clap, like, yeah, oh, yeah, I believe that. I mean, I know you're probably right. <laughs> I mean, I know the Bible says that, so, okay. Listen, he gave it freely, but your faith activates it. If you go through life and you go, I don't know whether I believe that or not, then you're not going to enjoy it. Come on, God's not going to break down your door with a dump load truck full of money just to prove to you he's good. No, he wants you to believe he's good. Come on. Yes, that's right. In spite of it, then you enjoy it. Amen. Come on. He is not going to just magically cause, you know, your body to just be well when you never pray and ask God or, or believe God or anything. He's just not going to just, you're healed. I wish it was that easy. You ever been in one of those relationships where somebody does something for you all the time? They tell you how beautiful you are and how wonderful you are. And how she's, yeah, and they just, you're the best thing since sliced bread. And, and you're just, and they, and they just fawn all over you all the time. And you don't have to do anything to earn any kind of reciprocation. They just, just, oh. What happens? Turn off. I think we need to see other people. Can you just calm down a little bit, please? There's something about us that wants to have a give and take relationship. But for whatever reason, people think God's just so big and extravagant that he's just going to do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. However he wants to do it. If he wants me healed, I'll just be healed. If he wants me to be blessed, then I'll just be blessed. The thing about it is, is God already purchased through Jesus your healing, already purchased your blessing, already purchased your 
Come on now. Already purchased your prosperity. He's already purchased your joy. He's already purchased this stuff. And if you're just sitting on it, waiting on those things for him to just come fawning in like some lovesick boyfriend and just be like, here you go. You're just the greatest thing since sliced bread. You're going to be waiting forever. Come on, all you folks that hate to be in needy relationships. God's not needy. <laughs> he gave you all that stuff for free, but it's up for it's up to you to believe God will will give that to you. Romans chapter 5 verse number 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, look at those next two words, by faith. Now, what does that mean? That goes back to that eternal salvation thing we were talking about. Nobody can talk you out of it. You know you're saved. Why? Because you did what you're supposed to. Jesus is Lord of my life. I believe God raised him from the dead. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. There ain't no God. Yes, there is, and he saved me. Nobody can talk you out of it. We've been made with and right in God's sight by faith. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. There's those words again. Come on. For us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. And privilege is a real popular word right now. Real popular. It is being talked about everywhere. Privilege this and privilege that. Let me tell you something. This kind of privilege crosses every, every single one of the barriers you can throw out there. Color barriers, race barriers. It doesn't matter. Come on, nationality barriers, where you use race barriers. If you're southern, if you're northern. Come on, this privilege right here is not based on any of that. Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. Who's he talking to? Every human being he ever created. Where, listen, look what he says, where we now stand. And we confidently and joy, uh, and, and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. God being for you is what the church calls grace. Now, there's a lot of crazy things being taught about grace right now. But this, this one right here, you can put this in the bank. God being for you is grace. Now, check this. That's his part. Grace is his part. It's free. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to turn it off. There's nothing you can do to turn it on. There's nothing you can do to, I mean, listen, you can live like the devil and there's still grace is available to you. That makes people nervous. You say, man, are you just saying that, you know, you can live however you want to live? You can live however you want to live. That doesn't mean that the stream of grace isn't flowing from the throne. It's there. It's available. But you may not be enjoying it. God being for you is grace. That's his part. All right? It never changes. It never stops flowing. Listen to me when I say this. God is always for you. He is never against you. Ever. He is never against you. Yeah, but you don't know what I did last week. God is still for you. <laughs> yeah, but you don't know what I did last night. <laughs> God's not against you. He's for you. So I can go out and live however I want to live? No, because when you go out and live however you want to live, doing whatever you want to do, that means your faith, come on, is not activating the grace. You can't live however you want to live and expect the grace to manifest in your life. The grace is there. 
It is flowing. It is something you can't ever turn off. But your faith is what puts you in a place, come on, to receive it. Now, I'm not just talking about faith to go, you know, uh, the mountain has to move. That's part of the, that's it. But your faith also determines your actions. You can't live in ways that the Bible teaches us is wrong and still say you're in faith for a, a blessing. That doesn't mean the blessing's not flowing, though. It's there. It is flowing right down. But your faith puts you in a place where you can't put your bucket under it to receive it. Come on, somebody. Grace is unearned. It is an unearned assistance. Now, listen to this. This is what grace is, and this is available to everybody that's been born. Grace is an unearned assistance from God. Grace is wonderful deeds coming from God. Grace is God's approval. This is all from Strong's. You can go look this up on your own. Grace is God's approval. What is that? God being for you? This is the next one. And this is big right here. This is going in the book I'm working on right now. Grace is also God's privilege. Mm. Oh, why you got to bring that word up? Brings up too many negative emotions in me life right now. This is God's privilege. This is free. It never changes. It never stops flowing. I have to receive that grace by faith. And that's your part. Listen to me. Nobody can give you grace. Nobody can give you God's blessing. I can't go and, and give to you. I, I can give you something I have that God tells me to give. But listen, I can't actually put you in a place to receive it. Okay? The reason people don't see more grace or experience God being for them is because they, number one, don't know how much he is for them. Listen, if we really knew how much God was for us, we'd be walking in a whole lot more of it. And this is why we get mad when we see some other, somebody else walking in it. We go, well, that ain't fair. Because we're limiting it to what we think with our own peanut little brain. But God's blessings are for everybody. How can you say that, Pastor? Because I've been in the I've been in the third world countries where they don't have anything. No one, I mean, not even a, 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 a one hundredth of the economy that they have here in the United States. I've been to those countries. Just was in one not too long ago. I mean, we're going to show you pictures. Ed's got pictures of out in the bush country in Kenya, where they don't have anything. And yet there are people standing in the midst of them who are blessed beyond, you're, you would be blown away at how blessed they are financially. Ed's there with a, with a Kenyan pastor who's from this village and he's handing out money like it's tissues. Am I exaggerating that? He was just, you were like Ed, or not Ed, but pastor was just blessed. He's blessed. He's blessed. I've been to those places where people, you know, you, you, you see all around them rubble. And you get to their house and it's like, boom. It's like, whoa. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things is not the same. What, what, what is, why? What's going on here? They experience, come on, God's privilege in their life. And they know, how, they know how much God is for them. Okay? If you get a hold of how much God is for you, there's no limit that any man can put on you. There's nothing anybody can do to hold back the blessing from you. Once you know how much God's for you, there's nothing anybody can say to you that could keep you from being what he wants you to be. It all will hinge on how much you believe that. Once you know it. The second thing is, they don't believe how much he's for them. 
They can hear, pe people can hear messages like this and they go, that's good, pastor, but I live in the real world. <laughs> you mean the real world that was formed by the word of God? You mean that real world? You mean the real word, world that says there was nothing that was made that was not made without his words? You mean that real world? Come on, you mean the real world that God literally spoke and it just, it just popped out of nowhere? You mean that, that real world? You mean the real world that is at its basis, beyond what we can see, down to the subatomic, come on, level, is all the way down to just a sound wave? You mean that real world? I mean, seriously. They go down further than the atom, down to what makes up an atom is a sound wave, a vibration. You mean, you mean that real world that can still be affected by another sound wave? You mean the same world that we all live in that's real, that can be changed by the same word of God that created it? You mean that real world? See, if you start believing, okay, you can hear a, a word like this, and you can know, and you can say, yeah, I mean, pastor says, God's for me, but I don't believe it. Then what you know doesn't matter, and what you hear doesn't matter. The reason people don't experience more of God's grace or favor or <laughs> Whatever word you want, they don't experience God being for them more. It's because they really don't believe how much God's for them. You, as we close, you have to choose to believe what God says about your situation. You have to believe that his direction is calling you closer to your answer and walk in it. If he says, I need you to do this, then you have to believe if I take that step, he's taking me that direction. That's faith. Come on. If he says, I need you to stop doing that, then you go, but God, what does that have to do? I mean, I got a relationship with you. Yeah. Yeah, but he's trying to get you to a blessing right now. So stop doing it and start, okay, by faith. You know, it had nothing to do with my eternal salvation. I'm going to walk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk away from it, God, and I'm going to do what you asked me to do. That's by faith. Your faith will follow his direction. And then you have to believe that the answer that you need in your life right now is actually coming into your life right now based on what he's had to say. Your faith will activate how much God is for you in your life. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Oh, I don't know about that, Pastor. Pastor. Then go ahead and walk around and <laughs> don't experience it. But I am. I'm going to experience God's grace in my life. I'm going to choose to believe God's for me. And I'm going to go find out how much. Because I want to see that in my life. When I'm sick, I want to know God is for me getting out of the hospital. Come on, when I got a need, I want to believe God's for me getting that need met and so I'm going to choose to believe God is for me he's for me the great part about it is he's for you today too and you can have all kinds of needs you're facing right now God's for you does he want me to have this done in my life yeah he wants you to walk in it he wants you to walk in a blessing right now he wants you to have that need met does he want me to have, you know, does he want me to have great things happening around me? Yes, he wants those things happening in your life. He wants you to have what he says you can have. Now, it all starts with you having a relationship with him. Because if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then you'll never know how much he's for you. Today's the day where you can be introduced to this Jesus who is for you. He's for you. If that's you today, 
and you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you need to have, uh, enter into a relationship with Jesus. Then I'm going, to have, I'm going to ask you this one thing, and I want you to say a prayer with me this morning. But here's why I want you to say it. I don't want you to say it just, just to go through the motions. I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I believe Jesus is God's son? And do I believe that God raised him from the dead? If you can answer yes to both of those questions, then you are in a primary place that you can have a relationship with Jesus. Well, what about me giving up all these things and sin and all this other stuff? Listen, you do all that once you're in the relationship with him. He starts to lead you away from those things. But that's between you and him, and he leads you away. He leads you down the further line. You don't have to give up things in order to have a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to stop doing something in order to have a relationship with Jesus. You... You just need to believe that he's God's son and that God raised him from the dead. And then you need to make a confession that you do. And if you'll confess that today, don't worry about all this other stuff. Yeah, but I smoke and I do that. Don't worry about it. He will lead you away from that. He'll lead you away from those things. The closer you grow to him, your faith gets closer to him. He's the one that will address those kind of things. But it all has to start with that relationship today. So if that's you, and you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you need to receive him into your life, I want you to say this prayer with me and make him. Just confess what you believe. Say this with me this morning. Father God, I come before you today a sinner. But I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I believe that he is Lord of all. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name, amen. You said that prayer with me this morning? (laughs) You're not the same person that walked in those doors. You've just gone through the ultimate transformation. You just, you just became somebody else. Now let me tell you what's going on. God was for you before. The Bible tells us how much more is he for you now. He is so much for you. But as you start down this road, traveling down this road, you're going to experience him in ways that you just think, why isn't the church preaching that? I know. I've been asking myself that same question. Why don't more churches preach that? He's so good. Come on, who would testify that this morning? He's so good to us. So faithful. He just does things, just blows your mind sometimes. So good. So good. Lord, just just praise him right now. Just thank you. Lord, thank you for the good things you've done in our lives. Lord, we're so glad. Oh, man, you've blessed us so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we pray today that you'll help us, Lord, to see how much you're for us. That we'll start realizing, we'll start realizing with unshakable faith everything that you provided for us. That our faith will grow and our faith will become something that can reach out and pull those blessings into this world. That we'll be able to see them. And we'll never stop giving you the praise. We'll never stop giving you the glory. We'll never stop telling somebody else how good you are. We'll never stop telling people how much you've done in our lives. We'll never stop painting a picture of the goodness of you. We'll never stop letting our light shine to others so that others will come to know you the same way we do. Lord, we thank you for that, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's good. Come on, he's good. He's so good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.